Conference, your source for JVM knowledge. Hola. Mi amo Todd Sharp. Um, and that is the uh, extent of my Spanish knowledge, so um, forgive me if I, if I can't. Actually, I take that back. Um, you know, I find it funny that I, I can program in about nine different languages, but I can only speak one, you know, and I, I've tried so many times to, to learn Spanish, and I've, I've been exposed to it. I grew up in an area that was, had a very large uh, Puerto Rican population, so I've been exposed to Spanish my whole life, but yet I only know like 50, 100 words, so, um, you know, it, you would think that would be a good thing, but I go to a coffee shop and I, and I say, uh, you know, uno cafe con leche, and then they say like two sentences, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, anyways, um, this is my talk on how I automated my barn with Arduino Raspberry Pi streaming Docker Kubernetes autonomous DB in the cloud. So, um, kind of a little bit of everything. This is a safe harbor statement, whatever that means. Um, so here's our agenda today. We're going to talk, uh, I'm going to give you a little background about the project. Uh, we're going to talk some about the architecture, and then we're going to look at some code and some other cool things. Uh, about me, uh, I always like to emphasize that first and foremost, I'm a full stack developer. I have been for 15 years, um, started off back in the cold fusion days. Um, uh, so as I said, currently at Oracle. Um, and formerly, I spent 15 years at AT&T and uh, spent seven years at a government consulting firm in the U.S. called Booz Allen Hamilton. So um, someone was talking, I think Michael, uh, or somebody was talking about uh, supporting really old versions of IE, so I have uh, definitely have some sympathy for that. <clears throat> but I'm glad I'm not there anymore. So I was born in a city called Cleveland, Ohio. Has anyone heard of Cleveland, Ohio? Been there. Been there, yeah. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, Cleveland Browns, American football, Cavaliers, LeBron James. Everyone's heard of LeBron James, right? <laughs> sure. Um, so I was born there, lived in that area. Uh, so a very urban area for the first 20 years of my life. And then we moved to a little town called Medina, Ohio, um, when I got married in 2002. I better remember that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> did the uh, whole, this is my house right here, up here, uh, did the whole kind of American dream, you know, our kids were born in the neighborhood and, um, you know, enjoyed the suburbs for a while. Uh, in fact, this area is only about 10 minutes from where LeBron James lives in Ohio. Uh, then in 2014, uh, my wife and family, uh, wife and kids and I moved to a little tall town called Blairsville, Georgia. Um, and it's in the northern part of Georgia, about two hours from Atlanta, and very rural, very quiet, very small town. This is not my view from my house, because if it was, I would be there right now drinking coffee and not standing here with you. Um, no, I... I yeah, you, absolutely. Um, no, but this is in Blairsville, and it's a beautiful area, hiking trails and all that. Um, so... The reason I tell you all this is, one, so you don't think I'm some Southern American hillbilly, because um, I, I was born in the city. Um, no, but um, when we moved to Blairsville, we did what a lot of people do, and um, we uh, got some animals and, and started a little farm. They call them hobby farms, right, because it's not like subsistence farming or um, any of that. It's just a hobby, something fun. Um, so we got some chickens. We got a little pig. We don't eat him, but he's our pet. Uh, <laughs> just making sure you knew, um, but uh, we, we get eggs every day, and it's just fun to have, you know, and so we built the barn, um, a little, little pasture area so that they don't uh, escape on us, but um, you kind of learn when you, when you build these kind of things that they're a lot of work, um, you know, you, it's almost like another job. Every morning you have to get up and you have to go out and open up the barn and feed the animals and make sure they have fresh water and, um, you know, throughout the day, make, especially in Georgia where it gets pretty hot, make sure they have fresh, clean water throughout the day. Um, and then every night, you need, well, at least with my chickens, I've spoiled them 
and I turn a light on them every night, uh, turn a light on so they can see their way into the barn and get on the roost every night. Um, and then, so, you know, I have to go out there and turn on the light and then come back out a half hour later when they all decided they've, they're ready for bed. Turn the light back off, shut the barn. Um, so what I did was, um, being the hardcore nerd that I am, I decided, you know, how can I automate some of this and make my life a little easier? Um, and that's one of the things that I tend to do. I don't know if anyone else can relate to this, but when I want to learn something new or tinker with something, I, I try to solve a real problem. You know, and it's not, I mean, not a problem per se, but I try to have some kind of benefit to my life so that when I'm applying that solution and learning that technology, um, I'm tying my knowledge and the learning experience to that solution and actually making it mean something to me instead of writing another to-do app, you know, I mean, how many to-do apps have we all written uh, over the years? Um, so, so that's what I decided to do. I decided to kind of build this initial system, and I called, I'll call this one version one as we go through here. And so I, you know, got a little Raspberry Pi and uh, uh, some sensors like this uh, RF transmitter, uh, temperature sensor over here, and, and I wired it all up. And I installed it in my barn. I have a little webcam over here. That, that's the temperature sensor. Uh, there's a door sensor, so I can tell whether the door is open or closed. And I installed it and programmed it and got it working. And it was nice. Um, I had the temperature monitoring, the door sensor. I, my son is uh, 11 years old, so um, a lot of times you say, uh, Dominic, did you close up the barn? Oh, yeah, Dad, I did, sure. Oh, really? Can we, can we take a look at this? Um, so those kind of things. Um, <laughs> you all have kids. <laughs> um, the RF outlet I can use to control the lights turning on and off so I don't have to go out there every night and turn it on, have a little scheduled task that it's actually neat. It's, there's a Java library um, that will tell you sunset every night or sun, sun, sun up or sundown. Um, so I just schedule the job for half hour before sunset and half hour after sunset every night. So it turns it on and then turns it off. Um, and I built a little web-based interface with it. Uh, it was Grails 3.2, I think. Uh, yeah, something around there. And, and this is what it looks like here. Um, but it had some shortcomings. I mean, you know, it wasn't by any means a fully automated, worthy of smart things uh, solution by any means. Um, it, the first biggest thing is it's not web accessible, right? Um, I, I didn't want to open up my local LAN, you know, open a port in my firewall and, and risk the things that come along with that. So I just have it on my local LAN, which is nice. I can sit in my office or in my recliner and pull it up and uh, see what's going on. Um, it had some limited features. There was no motorized doors, uh, no automated feeding and watering and uh, no data persistence. It was, all, it was all just a live look at the data. So we, you'd open up the web interface and it just tells you what the sensor reads right now. Um, so when I started at Oracle back in September, um, and I apologize, I'm a, I like to walk around a lot. So if that's confusing, I'm sorry, or distracting. Um, so when I started at Oracle in September, uh, I thought back to this project. And, and as I said, I tend to use these kind of problems or, or projects as a way to learn new things. And when I started at Oracle, I kind of looked at all of our cloud offerings and I said, man, there's a lot of stuff here, you know, and uh, yeah, I've been a developer for, I know Docker and, uh, you know, Groovy and all these things, but there's so much more that I don't really know. I didn't know Kubernetes. I didn't deal with streaming at all. I didn't, uh, hadn't, you know, had experience with cloud events or much with serverless. So I said, I need something to help me get up to speed on this stuff quickly. And like I said, another to-do app wasn't going to cut it. So I said, what if I rebuild this barn project? And I have basically an unlimited cloud account here. What can I do? I can do whatever I want. And I can use it to um, really learn all this stuff. And um, so I said, well, I'll rebuild this barn project, and I'll do it in a prototype form. Um, basically a little kind of scale model of what I would do if I were to really deploy it to my barn. Um, and there's kind of two reasons for that. One, it's going to be really easy to show you guys what it looks like uh, in scale form as opposed to my entire barn, and I wouldn't really be able to demonstrate that really well. Uh, and two, 
um, because the cost involved with getting motors to operate full-size doors and these kind of things would kind of end up costing me a lot of money. Um, so it seemed to be the best solution to kind of build a little prototype. Uh, there's some little Lego bits and, and that kind of stuff in it involved. Uh, and we'll take a look at that in a little bit. But the first requirement, obviously, right, was that it had to be cloud-based. And I wanted to have a real-time web interface so that when you log onto the web, you could see the data flowing into the system in real time, right? So I didn't want to do any kind of polling or, or anything like that. I wanted a real-time web-based interface. Um, I wanted data persistence so that I could do trend analysis, maybe temperature over time, how many times my son lied to me about shutting the door, these kind of things. Um, and potential machine learning. Uh, I've not done any of that yet, um, but there's potential to do that for sure with the data persistence. I wanted to simulate automated feeding and watering, uh, and we'll look at automated watering. I haven't built a demo yet for automated feeding, but it would follow the same type of con concepts. And I wanted mechanized doors, and I wanted it to be remotely controlled so that I can stand here 4,500 miles from my home and, and demo this and control things. Um, so here's the system, and this is my fallback video in case things don't work, but we're going to actually go ahead and take a look at the system right now. Let me reload this guy. Well, that goes. I'll launch VNC. Oh, don't you do that to me. We'll reopen it. So this is should it feel like working? So that's a live look into my office right now in Georgia. Right? See how well you can see that. Can you see it well enough? Yeah. Okay. Good. Live. So what's that? Is this live? Live. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, which it is currently 10 a, 10.45 at home. <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> that's probably my wife. Oh, we're having work done at my house today. They're putting in a walkway. I hope the workers aren't like... Oh, let me mute it. <laughs> yeah, I hope that's muted. Is that muted? or is it? No, that's not. Okay, all right. Yeah. <laughs> my wife yelling at my kids and, you know. Uh, so what we have here, over here, is a little door, and that's a pig. Can you see that? It's a Lego pig. I paid $7 for that stupid thing. <laughs> the internet is great though, right? Um, this is a Lego door. So this door right here is solenoid controlled, so there's a little solenoid that locks un and unlocks. I didn't get a linear actuator on it yet, which is like the kind of you know, little arms that, uh, that you can motorize, but I, I do have that on the list. Um, but the reason I did that is because my pig, he's 100 pounds, and uh, he can open the door himself, right? So he just hits it with his big snout and it opens. Uh, but this right here is a gear-driven, uh, there's a, uh, not a worm gear, but just a, a gear with a rack on top of it. So we'll see that opening and closing. Uh, over here, there's two beakers full of water. There's some peristaltic hosing, uh, peristatic hosing, and a pump in there, which is in a bowl with um, Play-Doh on the bottom of it, because I, as I tested it, that pump would vibrate itself off the table. <laughs> Um, so that's what that bowl is. Uh, and behind it, you can't see it that well, but right there where the cursor is pointing, there's a digital, um, digital photo screen, you know, a digital picture frame that rotates through some random pictures. So um, let's fire it up and pray that it works. It should. I've only tested it 500,000 times. Uh, projects. So what, I'm, what we have over here, this is the Raspberry Pi, which is in uh, the gray box behind everything, it's uh, what you saw in the previous picture. It's a housing for sprinklers, so sprinkler timers for uh, sprinkler systems, watering systems. And I, I found that everything fit pretty well inside of there. And if I were to actually put it in the barn, that would be a nice weatherproof enclosure to keep everything safe. Um, so that's where the Raspberry Pi is. And I'm remoted into it with <coughs> VNC. And I'm just pulling up, uh, and I'm going to launch 
the script on the Pi itself. There we go. All right. Now, I'm not saying this is going to be the coolest shit you've seen this weekend, <laughs> but I'm not saying it's not the coolest shit. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're running and we're publishing data. And if we come over here and pull up the interface, We've got data coming in. All right, so let's talk about this real quick. Um, over here, we have some pods representing the doors. So this is what I call door zero, which is this solenoid-driven door, and this is door one. Each of them are currently closed, as indicated by a door sensor on them, and the light for door one is off. There's a little LED right there that will be our light. Um, right now, it's currently 68 Fahrenheit in my office, 20 Celsius, uh, and 18% humidity. And the really cool stuff is down here. So these are real-time temperature and humidity chart, which is updating every time the system sends an event. And if we come down here, this is a water level. So this is the current water level, which is this beaker on the right. So the concept here is that, um, and this could, in, in real practice, <laughs> the, if, if there's any kind of shaking on the desk, that tends to do that. Um, so the theory is that I could either go two ways if this were a real system. I would have a big source 55-gallon barrel of water that I would you know, use as a source water, and then the pet uh, bowl would be the pet side of things. There's a, a white, <laughs> there's a white uh, sensor right here, which is submerged into the water, and that's the water level sensor. That thing was stupid expensive too, um, but you know some of these things are. Um, so the the theory is that that's how I would water. Now, if I enable the pump. It's gonna, there's going to be a little bit of lag here. There we go. See the pump, uh, the uh, the hose moving there. It's kind of hard because it refills kind of slow, but yeah, it's moving there. So it's filling up as we speak, and you can see the chart reflecting that the water level is rising in real time. And the theory is that once it gets to, well, the hope is that once it gets to 150 milliliters, it will shut off. Um, and we can trust that I've put enough water in the source so that it doesn't overflow if it doesn't shut off. <laughs> um, if we go back up to the doors up here and we look at door one, I won't show you door zero because it's really hard to see that solenoid. But if I click open on door, door one with a little bit of delay because of the webcam, you should see door one open. Do it. will not fail right now because I've tested you 500 times. Okay, let's go back down here. So this is an ambient light level sensor um, which detects the light level in the room. So I figured this would be handy in the barn, you know, to know uh, what the light, either I could either use it in, inside or outside to know, you know, tr maybe below a certain threshold of daylight, I would automatically turn on the light. So if we... Um, Look at the light level chart here. And if I turn on my office light, we can see it jump. 
and they're finally lit up over there. Home automation is awesome. <laughs> um, I'm still ticked that this door is not opening. I wonder, let's do something real quick. And I won't spend too much time because I know I have, let's kill that pod. Just to see. And we'll come back to that in, in a few minutes. Um, I'll show you real quick one more before we move on. So, um, and I didn't enable that yet either, so let's do that while we're doing everything fun here. <coughs> let's start this guy back up. <coughs> All right, so events. I should have done this before. I apologize. I meant to enable this previously, but I didn't want it running constantly, so um, you'll see why in a minute here. But if I just enable this rule and go back. So as I said, there's a digital picture frame that rotates between uh, different pictures. And you can see down here a few of them as an example. Um, there's a motion sensor attached to the Raspberry Pi. And it, the intention is that it would detect motion outside of the barn. And the camera would be able to take pictures upon it detecting motion. Um, the reason for that is in the area we live in, there's a lot of predators like black bears and foxes and coyotes and hawks and things like that. Um, so the, the, con the theory is that I would be able to detect these things, take a picture, and do some AI and determine if there's a predator that's um, in my yard. So if I pull up my text messages here, and if we take a snapshot, it's going to take a few minutes. But it, OK, it is taking the picture. Good. Um, and we'll, we'll come back and look at this when we look at the code for that. But um, let's try the door one more time. What a disappointment. This has worked forever. I apologize. But let's get back to the code or the presentation, and uh, we'll go from there. So we don't need my video. Of course, it would show the door opening, but we won't show that. So let's talk about the architecture. Um, the Arduino is what I call the heart of the system, right? So I try to give you an analogy to kind of make it a little easier. And like any body, the system can't live without the heart, right? So the Arduino is the heart of the system. And it, what it does is, um, you're all familiar with Arduinos. There's little micro boards. Um, there's no operating system. They're very lightweight. They just run one program over and over in a loop endlessly. And usually what you do is you read sensors and, or turn on, uh, activate other sensors or activate motors or things like that. So the Arduino is the heart of the system. Um, the Raspberry Pi, I think of it like the brain, right? So it does a little bit of intelligence on uh, what data is coming in, either from the Arduino from, or from the web. And it kind of decides what needs to happen there. Um, what was originally a Kafka queue, and I might even have that in the title, which I now switch to streaming, and it, because it's now uh, using Oracle Cloud Streaming, is like the stomach, right? So what does the stomach do? It receives input, and it produces output, right? <laughs> that does not mean my data is shit. Um, <laughs> the microservice is the digestive system. It also receives input. Um, but it does something with that input. Like, so just like your digestive system kind of absorbs nutrients from the food that you eat into your body, the microservice kind of does that too. It takes a little bit of that data and it does something with it, stores it in the database. Um, the front end is the skin, right? So it's what you see when you look at the system. It's the, the beauty of the system. Autonomous DB and object storage, that's the fat. I got plenty of that. 
um, it's where everything is stored. So the data is stored. So just like your um, stomach and digestive system would store excess fat in your fat, uh, our data is stored in the DV in the object storage. Cloud events are the ears. They listen, right? So our cloud events that I've set up for the system will listen for when an object is an image, snapshot, is persisted to object storage. Um, there's a serverless piece that's the hands. So just like your hands would work with your ears, if I asked you, can you pick up that bag, your ears would hear that, and your hands would perform some action, right? And finally, you would say to me, I've picked up the bag. So that's cloud notifications. That's the mouth, right? Here's what it all looks like in kind of a fancy little diagram. Um, if we look up here, there's some sensors that hook up to the Arduino. The Arduino connects via serial, uh, via a USB cable to the Raspberry Pi. It also has some sensors but, uh, that connect to the Pi. The Pi pushes data to the message queue, which in this case is Oracle Streaming. It used to be Kafka. And actually, the really cool thing about this system is um, I've, the version I'm showing you today is written in Groovy for the Pi and the microservice, but I've also written versions in Node, and really the intention is that I can use this talk at any conference I go to for the next year, <laughs> just change out the pieces a little bit. Um, but it all works pretty good, too. Uh, from, the, from the streaming message queue to the microservice, which is in this case is a Helidon uh, Groovy-based Groovy, uh, Helidon micro framework application. Um, I wanted so bad to write like a Micronaut version, but I didn't have time. So, uh, And that connects to the front end, which is an Angular app. Uh, both of these are Docker containers deployed in Kubernetes. The uh, microservice obviously talks to the database, which is within Oracle Cloud, but outside of Kubernetes. And object storage down here gets data from the Pi directly. and it talks to FN, which is our hosted serverless option that's coming soon. Uh, it's in limited uh, access right now. So let's talk about the flow of data that I just basically did. The Arduino reads the sensor, it formats the data for output, and then it prints it to serial. The Pi will read the serial, parse the JSON, and post it to the outgoing queue. And the microservice consumes, consumes on that outgoing topic, persists the APP, ATP, Autonomous Transaction Processing. That's our Oracle database in the cloud. Um, and emits events for potential e event source endpoints. And then the front end establishes an e event source in JavaScript and consumes the real-time server sent events. Um, who's using server sent events? Very few, huh? Is everyone familiar with them for the most part? You know, you understand? Yeah? Okay. Um, we'll take a look at some of the code, but um, I thought it was a better solution to me than using something like WebSockets or uh, even polling, God forbid. Um, so let's look at some of the code. The first code you'll see here, my apologies, uh, I am not a C++ developer, so this is not the prettiest code. Uh, and that's the only hard part about our programming to me is that you have to program it in C++. But essentially what it does is it builds up this big JSON buffer of objects, and uh, an array of uh, objects. So each, each time that it runs the loop function, it'll read the temperature sensor, it'll read the water sensor, the light uh, state, the, state um, the motor state, all these things, and it'll just build up this big JSON object of uh, events, or yeah, events, and at the end of the loop, it'll print that whole big J JSON string to serial. Um, throughout the system, I have this kind of contract of constant values. So I have like, for example, temperature zero or door zero and all these things. And each application has that same exact um, set of static constants. And that's to enable me to really reduce the payload being sent across the wire, right? So especially when you're talking about these real-time events, I want it to be as slim as possible. So sending you know, zero instead of temp zero saves a couple bytes each, each trip. The next piece is the Raspberry Pi. <coughs> and what it does is it um, has a consumer, which, uh, oh, I'm sorry, before I get that far, this is the um, 
serial reading. So it just reads serial, determines if there's bytes available, um, then it creates a new byte array, reads the bytes, converts it to string. Um, it looks a little funny, but on line eight, I parse the text to make sure that um, it can be parsed to JSON, and then down here I convert it back to string. Uh, and the reason I do that is because when you're dealing with serial, like it's 1980 or something, um, you know, sometimes you don't get an entire, you don't read the entire serial packet. Um, so I just want to kind of make sure that I'm getting an actual JSON object that can be parsed instead of a partial uh, piece of the serial. And on line 14 there, we just loop, well, 13 to 15, we just loop over all of the messages that we read and we send it uh, with the message producer up to the uh, streaming queue. And that, uh, if, if using Kafka, the first version, uh, on line three there, we just have a Kafka producer, and we call the send method, create a new record, and send that up to Kafka. Um, the new version with OCI, Oracle Cloud, looks uh, pretty similar. We just create a, a message details object with an array of messages and a message request, and then we just call put messages on our uh, SDK client from the Oracle Cloud Java SDK. So at this point, we've read data. We've, uh, well, we've created data from the Arduino, we've read it, and we've pushed it up to the uh, Kafka queue or Oracle streaming uh, topic. <coughs> Excuse me. So at this point, I kind of realized I had a problem on the microservice side of things. Um, I wanted to consume data uh, at all times, regardless of whether or not there was a front-end client connected, right? So, <clears throat> that meant that it all I had to do was create an application scoped transient bean, start it up when the uh, application starts, and just read in a loop, and consume that uh, event queue. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> um, the problem is uh, Kafka is read once, right? You, you, it's a... Uh, uh, read once. So once you've read uh, something from a Kafka queue, it's no longer available to be read. So that meant that when my front-end client would connect, um, I needed it to get those real-time events too, but um, I couldn't read them again because they've already been read from, from the uh, application scoped transient bean. Um, the solution that I came up with was to use the observer pattern. And we've all probably seen something like this, right? So this is the consumer on the microservice side. Uh, it just grabs all the records from the queue, loops over them, parses, the, uh, parses them into JSON. And then on line nine there, we have an event emitter. Uh, and this is just a, a class that I created uh, that basically just emits events within the application. So my consumer can read all these events happily, persist them to the database on line eight, and just shout off to the application, hey, if you care, this, uh, this just happened, right? So when you get to the uh, HTTP endpoint side of things, this is my server send event endpoint. Uh, the first thing I do is just register a, a server send event, event sync, um, and then just initial event on line six, I just tell the front end, hey, we're ready to go. Um, and here's where the, the real magic happens, right? So I have this groovy closure, that's a message handler, and down on line 13, on my event emitter, I add it as a listener. So it's kind of, it probably looks real similar, well, I'm sure you've all seen this kind of pattern before, but um, it, it's almost like something you would see in Angular or something, on, or in Node, um, where I'm basically just adding this listener, and every time that emit method is called from, from the other, from the consumer, it's going to call this handler. And what this handler does is it just creates a server send event and it broadcasts it, right? So it kind of was a nice way to, to solve that problem of always being able to read that data and persist it and at the same time pushing it to the front end client uh, when one was connected. So on the Angular side of things, it couldn't be any simpler. We just create an event source. We point it at the stream URL, which is my microservice endpoint where I'm broadcasting from. <coughs> And then I just have an on-message handler. So every time a message comes in, 
um, I do something with it. Right? I figure out, uh, do I need to add it to the temperature chart? Do I need to turn on the, <laughs> open the door that's not opening? Um, so any, that flow looks like this. Uh, basically, all the events come, you know, as we've talked about. It comes from the Arduino to the Pi to the Q to the microservice and then both to the front end and to the database. So the next kind of piece of the Pi here is the incoming flow. And that's the data that goes from the web to the barn. So when I click those buttons, this is what's supposed to happen. So on user input, a button press or a link click or something like that. And I talked about this with Jeff uh, the other night, and he made me feel really good that I chose the right decision <laughs> for this. Uh, because I don't know if you know Jeff. He's, he works at Samsung or uh, Smart Things, which is owned by Samsung, and they do home automation stuff. Um, but he said a lot of times people make the problem when they try to do this of like opening a stream and, and doing that real-time push backwards through the flow. Um, but the, the decision I made when I designed the system was to just make an HTTP post to the microservice. And um, from that point, the microservice uses a different topic, which I call the incoming topic, and just posts another uh, message to the stream going back towards the barn. Um, the Raspberry Pi is going to consume that incoming topic and then just write to, that, write to the serial connection that it's reading from back to the Arduino. Um, so I always kind of laugh that this entire system is like a series of infinite loops and, and switch case statements, um, but there's a lot of that going on. So, you know, um, the loops that keep the consumers open and produce, uh, not the producers, but the consumers, and, um, and then the switch case within the Arduino, what do I have to do with this data that you're giving me? Um, and then finally, the Arduino is going to receive that in incoming message and perform a task. Um, so here's how it looks in code. And I'm running uh, short on time, so I'll move a little quickly. But essentially, the front end just makes an HTTP post down on line 19 uh, containing a JSON message. The uh, microservice producer sends that message, returns a message to the front end saying, we're good. Uh, and this consumer looks almost identical to the one that was on the microservice side. It just reads the uh, queue and then uses the Arduino service to uh, write it back to, and this is just the Oracle Cloud version, again, creating a cursor uh, and calling a get request to read it. And finally, com port that write bytes, that writes it back to serial. So it, this is how the message gets to the Arduino. And then again, the Arduino just has a big switch case. It says, what do I need to do? If, if it's door one, I'm going to run motor zero, and I'm going to, uh, depending on whether or not you want me to open it, I'm going to run forward or backward, or live demo, not at all. Uh, and that data flow looks like this, just the reverse of the last one, right? Cool. What library? Yeah. It's called JSerialCom. You familiar with that? Yeah. It's a uh, it's a Java library that uh, it's not. I'll tell you, it's okay. It works, but the one I used in Node so much better because you could read until delimiter, and unless I was missing something, you couldn't do that with JSerialCom. So, like I said, I had to parse that JSON to make sure that I had the whole object and kind of it's almost like a try catch with jserialcom, but in the node library that I used, I could read until new line, and so I always knew I was getting the whole package, you know? So, uh, uh, are you familiar with any other Java serial libraries? Yeah, I've been looking into it for a long while now, but I, I'm trying to find it first. Adu link? Adu link? Adu link. Okay. Anywhere anymore. Right. But I have some notes on the laptop, but yeah, I don't have it with me. Okay. Because, yeah, I struggled with that uh, a while ago as well. Yeah. Yeah, I have a link to jserialcom in the end, so you could uh, check that out. But it works good, it works okay. Um, so, as I said a little earlier, the motion sensor runs on the Raspberry Pi. Um, the, the Groovy script that runs on the Pi uh, creates an event listener for motion events via a Pi4j library. Has anybody done any Raspberry Pi work? 
yeah, with Java and Groovy or Kotlin or I guess Micronaut can even run on it now, right? Um, yeah, pi for j is a great library. It's really cool. It's just uh, it's a way to kind of interface with the uh, GPIO pins on the on the Raspberry Pi. So um, I just said, like I said, I create an event listener, and uh, when it's called, it takes a snapshot and it uploads the snapshot to Oracle Cloud Object Storage. So everyone knows what S3 is, right? Bucket object storage in the cloud. So Oracle Cloud Object Storage is our version of S3. Um, the really awesome thing, and the reason why I wanted to show you this, is that when I use it in my code, I use the Amazon S3 API. So everyone who's worked with S3 has probably used the AWS uh, API, either Java or, or however you've used it. Um, Oracle Object Storage has a fully S3 compliant endpoint, so that you can basically you can literally use the Amazon API SDK to upload to Oracle Object Storage. It, it, there's only like one change you have to make. So uh, the reason I tell you that is just because if you know if you're thinking of migrating to Oracle Cloud, and that's one of your kind of pain points is you don't want to rewrite all your code to uh, you know if you have a lot of code that works with S3. You don't have to. Uh, very minimal changes, and you, your your code will work just the same. Obviously, you'd have to move your objects over, you know, to object storage. And uh, but then what happens is it triggers a cloud event. So these are brand new. In fact, they're limited access at Oracle. They're cloud uh, cloud events, uh, which is what is Amazon's? Uh, they, have, they have something similar, uh, but it's basically triggers based uh, our they're triggered based on a certain uh, event. So in, in this case, they, they have object storage, create bucket events, update bucket, delete bucket, uh, create object, delete object, those sorts of things. So they're just events that are triggered uh, based on certain actions. In, in my case, what I, how much time? Five minutes? Yeah, three minutes, four minutes. OK. Wow, we only have like 20 slides to go. <laughs> um, we trigger a serverless function. Uh, what I use, uh, I use an, a third-party API to analyze that and send a notification. And then again, I post a message to the stream so that the front end can update and say, hey, there's a new picture, and you can take a look at it. Um, so here's the uh, GPI uh, Pi4j code to add the listener. Um, here's where I use the Amazon S3 API. If you've used it, that should look really familiar to you put object request, s3 client put object, and this puts the object up into Oracle object storage. Um, creating my cloud event through the UI, you can also do that with the SDK or the CLI. Uh, my serverless function, Oracle serverless functions are based on FN, the FN project, uh, you've probably heard of that, uh, which uses <coughs> Docker containers, very small, lightweight Docker containers, so your function is, is deployed in a Docker container and when it's run on the server, the Docker container is pulled and turned, uh, fired up and run. Um, the timeout, that timeout is not my actual timeout. I think I have it set for 1,200 seconds now, which is like 30 minutes um, or whatever. I, I can't think straight right now. Uh, I can't do math on stage. Um, but it's a 30-minute timeout um, so that if you're, you're hitting it fairly frequently, or at least within the next 30 minutes, it doesn't pay that uh, price of re-downloading. Uh, well, it doesn't have to re-download, but it doesn't pay the price of spinning it up again. It keeps it warm, basically. And the cloud notification. Uh, I've kind of used a little bit of a hack down here. So currently, our cloud notifications, which is uh, kind of like our version of SNS, Amazon SNS, uh, we don't have support SMS, uh, text messages, but we have email and um, PagerDuty endpoint, so you can call a PagerDuty endpoint. Um, but I used a little hack of using my text message telephone number. Everybody knows you could do that. Uh, you can send an email to a certain number. Uh, every provider has a specific domain, but it's basically your phone number at, in my case, message.fi.google.com. And if you email that number, it will send an email or a, an SMS to your phone. So that's my little hack for getting text messages. Um, this is the serverless function. It uses the Clarify API. So when that event is fired uh, and it calls the serverless function, the serverless function gets an event. And this is just, a, I used Groovy 
uh, to create my serverless function. And it receives the event over here. The event contains certain pieces of data. So it contains like the namespace of the bucket, the uh, bucket key, the bucket name, and the object key. So I build the URL to that image, uh, which is just pointing at where that is. It's a public bucket. Otherwise, I could create a pre-signed uh, URL and use that. And it uses that clarify API to analyze the picture. So um, what that does is it just kind of gives us like standard kind of AI API. It'll give you the concepts that it detects in that picture. Um, then it builds up a little string and sends the notification, uh, which will send me the text message. So that flow looks like this. So if I click the take snapshot button, or if the motion sensor down here detects an event, it will post that image to object storage, which calls the serverless function and sends me my text message. I do want to show you this real quick. Um, I have tons more after this, but it, we probably won't get to it. Um, persistence. So I'm using Oracle Database for persistence. And when I originally created the demo, I was using Mongo because um, I didn't need, I didn't feel like it was a real highlight of the talk, the database, right? It's just where I'm storing the data and pulling it in and out from. Um, but a coworker of mine, who's actually now my boss, said, why don't you look into using uh, Oracle Database? And I said, well, you know, because it's not really, a, there's no point to doing it. And he said, well, yes, there is. Um, you can actually, does everybody know you can actually store JSON data in, in most database systems nowadays? Did anybody know that? Did anybody not know that? Yeah, so um, it's really cool. It's like a JSON data type. And it works just like, well, very similar to the way NoSQL databases work, where you can store a JSON document in a column. And the really cool thing about it is it actually works, right? So I have this string of an event that's stored in the data column. And I can actually query where data.fahrenheit is greater than 75, for example. So it will actually do the intelligence just like Mongo might do and only return those that, you know, the JSON document. Uh, it actually parses it out and, and does all the logic for you. So it supports pretty much everything you could do in Mongo. But to me, the, pro the pain I always had with Mongo was the API, it was OK, but I've been using SQL for 15 years, and I'm comfortable with SQL, you know. And to be able to work with JSON documents with a SQL-like API or uh, language was was pretty cool to me. Um, oh, I guess that is it. Well, look at that. So, solve personal problems. As I said, that was kind of my way to learn new tech. Um, Trying to think about non-traditional usages of tools and services. Message streaming and queues like Kafka and things like that are awesome. I had never played with them before, but I like them a lot. Um, complex problems, which, I mean, I guess it's not a complex problem, right? I'm just talking about chickens, and it's not life or death. But the fact that, you know, I can pull up a webcam and show you this from 4,500 miles away means it's kind of involved. Um, but it doesn't require a complex solution. Um, we talk about microservices a lot this weekend, and um, you know, it just to me it shows that I've created this like seven different projects that kind of combined together for this project, and I used C++, I used Node.js, I used Angular, TypeScript, Java, uh, Groovy, and they all kind of work together, and they're just their own little piece of the entire architecture, but um, they can work together easily. They don't have to be difficult. I know we didn't talk much about it, but Docker and Kubernetes are easier than they look. Uh, and you can use server and events for real-time data push. Please give me feedback. I would really appreciate it. Um, it helps me grow as a presenter. And it helps me learn. And if uh, you know there's anything that you liked or did not like, please absolutely tell me about it. And uh, it will make me a better presenter. And here's some contact info. Recursive codes on Twitter, if you're interested in following me. I blog quite frequently on the Oracle uh, developer's blog. You can email me. You can come visit me at my house in Georgia, and I will make you dinner. Um, and here's, those, uh, here's the uh, JCRLcom. So here's all my links. Um, 
different things that are used in the, proje in the project. All my code is up on GitHub, so github.com slash barn automation. If you're interested in seeing more about how I did any of it, please feel free to check it out. And that's my pig Milton. He <laughs> says thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Don't leave. <laughs> so here, real quick, if, can, can I show them something real quick? Real quick. No, real quick. So um, when I took that snapshot earlier, if you look over here, uh, <laughs> is it? Yeah. Where'd it go? It closed. The camera's gone. Where's the shot? There was a duke trying to go over there. A what? A duke. A duke? No, it's a chicken, a Lego chicken. Um, so here's the text message that fires off. Uh, and it died, in this case, it identified a landscape with nature, sky, uh, all those kind of things. If I scroll up and show you a, a previous one, let's see here. OK, so this one, this one found a wolf, right? So uh, let, let's see here. I'm sorry, sir. Yeah, the door's open. There's a chicken. 